All hey right. guys, what's up? This is Casey. Coach Tom. <laughs> and this is Shot Science Overtime number 155. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, we want to remind you that this is our live show where we talk to you guys about topics we think are going to make you a better basketball player, help you take you to the next level. It's going to be a longer show than like our tutorials, which are usually very short, uh, you know, under three minute videos. This is a longer video because we're talking directly to you guys. If it's not something that you are into, get out now while you can. Yeah. It's totally okay. It won't hurt our feelings, but maybe go tell your friends to check us out because they might be into it. Yeah. Um, but what we like to do is we have a topic up front that we talk about. And while we are talking about that topic, you guys are sending us your questions that we will answer after we're done with our, the topic that we chose. Um, so send us any basketball related question. It can be on shooting, passing, dribbling, defense, how to talk to your coach, athletic conditioning, vertical jump, whatever it is, we will do our best to give you guys our best answer to those questions. But before we do that, we have our topic that we want to talk about. And it's a topic we think is going to help you guys uh, become better basketball players. Just to be aware of it, maybe save you a little bit of time right. in figuring it all out. Right. So our topic for today are the three basic pitfalls of basketball players. Right. So why don't we jump into number one? You know, there's a whole list that we could probably put together, but we chose these just very quickly for you. Um, one of the things that, that is really important in being able to be an effective basketball player is number one is to be able to pass the ball with some skill. And that's one of the weakest areas of basketball, uh, especially on the high school level and probably in the junior high school worse. College usually it's much improved because you've got more select players that you're dealing with there. But the first thing that we think is really important is that you throw crisp passes one of the things I see, and I went to a couple of games last year that I was just appalled. I couldn't believe how poor the passing was. Uh, <clears throat> the passes were uh, just little uh, soft little uh, critters that hardly got there. Yeah, little fluff balls. Oh, uh, they were fluff balls. And the other, and players step in and knock them away, and here we go. We're going to the other end. And so well, crisp passing is really important for us. So that's the one of the, the thing that's really yeah. important. And sometimes you see it when people throw those little looping passes over yeah. the top of the defense, or it's just kind of like a little lob pass. Yeah. Those, not only are they easy to anticipate, they're easy to make up the time to get there. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so the defense just starts, you know, their eyes get big when they see that stuff mm -hmm. happen because they know, oh, that ball is going there, and I definitely have time to catch up and yeah. get it. Absolutely. And, and you know where the biggest problem with that is throwing the ball into the post? Yep. <clears throat> One of the weakest areas probably is be, uh, passing the ball into the post player, and it, that's two-sided. The guy who is receiving the pass, the post player, doesn't often give us the targets uh, for where he wants the basketball. And so we just kind of throw it in there aimlessly. And uh, when you figure that out and he helps you and tells you where he wants the basketball, then it gets a lot easier. Okay, so uh, that's that's an important consideration. We don't want to throw those fluff balls in there because they're just turnovers waiting to happen, and they happen pretty quickly. The other thing is not telegraphing your passes. Telegraphing your passes essentially is this, is that you look at another player and that there's a, a moment of uh, focus and everybody in the place can see what you want to do. And then you throw ahead and throw the pass and somebody steps in front of it and they're gone. Well, it's that unspoken conversation you're having with your teammate yeah, that, absolutely. that is easily interpreted by the other team. Yeah. So it's like you're looking at your teammate. He knows you're going to pass it. That's other people are also reading that, too. So you cannot do that. You have to, that's, I mean, that's one of the things that you need to iron out early in your basketball career. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we teach, and we think this is really important for every player to be able to do this, and, and that is this, is that we always work on our players to fake a pass someplace else before you make the pass to the person you really want to pass it to. And if you take just a moment there, if there's a person in front of me or there's somebody who's sagging in and I make a pass over uh, in this direction, maybe to the baseline or the post player, and then I pull it back and throw it to the point guard, usually players are out of the way. And so that's something big that we really spend time on too with players is fake a pass someplace else and then make a pass. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it comes down to as an offensive player, you cannot make it easy for the defense to do their job, which is yeah. defend you. Yeah. And so many people do make it easy by doing the telegraphing or the looping pass or, uh, you know, whatever. And if you are f not faking a pass to make a pass, you are making it that much easier for that guy to cover you. Right. So why don't you set them up 
and make their job harder by just doing a simple thing like faking a pass because they're going to have to react. They, they do react. Too. Be- because yeah. if, if they don't, then you see that they're not reacting and you can use that yeah. as, as a way to exploit them. Right. But if they over if they react and commit to that fake, then you have them in a spot where your job is easier yeah. and their job is harder. So yeah. you have to kind of get that into your system too. Right. So remember that fake a pass to make a yeah, pass. Yeah. So fake okay. high, pass low. Fake low, pass high. Right. I mean, it's it's really that easy. Or fake one or look one way and pass the other way. I mean, it's yeah. it's really that easy. Okay, and so that's that's really an important element for us to kind of work out. Okay, the second thing we're going to talk about today, and I think this is huge. Casey and I well, talk about on, this all the time. Okay, go ahead. Are we are we still talking about passing? Uh, we're we're leaving passing. Let right me now. let me hit one more thing in the passing category. Okay, go ahead. And that is that passing is also a responsibility of the person receiving the basketball. Yes. Yes, and very true. what you need to be aware of is the fact that you are responsible for the last about two or three feet of that ball getting to exactly. you. Whether you're in the post, whether you're on the perimeter, it doesn't really matter. You need to meet the pass. And so you can't just stand there and wait. You know, if you're just wide open and nobody's around you, I mean, that's a different situation. Yeah. But if you are standing there being defended, you need to be responsible for that other, uh, you know, last third of the of the pass. Yeah, go and to meet the ball. You need to step into it, meet the ball. That helps you with multiple things too. Yeah. Whether that's getting rhythm for your shot, whether that's uh, creating some space to be able to get by the defender, um, and in the post it gets you separation so you can create space there. I mean, there's there's so many reasons to do that. Yeah. But you know, it also shortens the pass that or the path that the, the that the pass has to go through right. to get to you. So you're going to be kind of uh, safeguarding that pass a little bit by shortening it. Right, right, right. How awful is that when you're playing in a game and you don't do that, and that defensive player steps right in front of you and takes the ball, and they go down and lay it up. Yeah, and and, you know, sh- and, and, and meeting that pass too. Yeah. you put that defender in a in a sticky situation for him to reach because he might he run might into you. He might just run into it, yeah. And uh, you know, you also take away that ability for them to step in and take that pass just by you know putting their hand up. Right, right, right. Okay, let's go okay, on. Okay, number two, um, and they don't come in any particular order. Is this is that we want to make sure that we're shooting on balance because a lot of players. <laughs> it was funny. I had students yesterday, and they they happen to be girls, but they're not bad. Uh, their high school girls, and each one of them was shooting off balance. They would take a little dribble and uh, hop into the shot, or they would just take and jump in the air, and they're sliding in the air. It is almost impossible to hit a stationary target like the basket when you're sliding in the air, either right or left, or if you're fading away, or if you're rushing the basket, for that matter. And so, well, well, we talk about it every week that we talk about shooting, and that yeah. is that directional variable that you add in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, shooting is a complex organization of movements as it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. If you're adding in extra variables, that is going to make your shot more complex. Right. Uh, you know, more uh, and more complexity makes it less repeatable, yep. which makes it less accurate. And so you want to limit the variables and being off balance and fading and falling and all these things will make your shot that much more difficult, that much harder, and your percentage will fall off very quickly. Right. And, and in that regard, we recommend that whenever you're going to get yourself ready to shoot, that you use a, a one, two, uh, uh, step footwork. Stop gather. Uh, we refer to it as stop and gather. Uh, when we are going in a particular direction, the the leg that is closer to the basket becomes our stop foot. Okay, and the other begins our gather foot as we gather to get ready to shoot, and that keeps us on balance. And that stop foot is is kind of like the foot that not only stops your horizontal momentum, but also acts as as kind of like a pivot for you to yes. kind of uh, round off your, Turn your, into, your yeah. yeah round off into your shot right right and so that's really important and so in that regard we really discourage people who hop into the shot and the reasons we'll just hit these real quick is that it's really difficult sometimes if I particularly if I'm going across the front of the basket and I'm going to hop into the shot turn my body to face up to the basket and then make a nice shot without my body drifting sideways. It's almost impossible to do. And uh, if you are able to do that, 
uh, hallelujah, but probably you're not. And so the thing that's very important for us is to not hop into the shot because you were just become too unstable to shoot the basketball and shoot it effectively. And here's one more thing I want to say about that too, mm -hmm. is that like we, like I was just saying, you have to convert your horizontal momentum exactly. into vertical momentum. Yeah. And if you're going full speed, you cannot hop into a shot and effectively uh, change that horizontal into vertical right because you are taking two points of contact and trying to put them down simultaneously into the right spots whereas if you're doing this stepping in one two you actually will be able to convert by having that stop foot and bringing that second point of contact to the other foot and right. going up into your shot and converting it from horizontal into vertical exactly and and we, what we do with that is we're able to eliminate that a slide once we jump in the air we're not sliding sideways we're not fading now that doesn't mean that players don't do it but it's a lot less likely to happen if we are not hopping into the shot okay now the other thing that we really think that kind of goes along with the shooting balance too is that we don't want to take and hop into the shot for another reason and that is that ends our dribble and we we're done right now we've got to either shoot it or give it up and so one of the things that we like with the one two is the fact that we can actually execute some counter moves out of that uh, and we have not ended our dribble necessarily so those are important items well yeah i mean it, it's kind of deceptive and it yeah. leaves your options open and yep. you can change your mind at the last second yeah if you're hopping in, you've basically decided that you are terminating what you were doing. Exactly. And, exactly. And so this one-two footwork is so important in all of those aspects, but also in the balance thing, yeah. because consider this, you are going from low to a high position. You're going from that low uh, positioning up into your shot. When you're hopping in, you go from a high where you are, you have to because you're basically leaving the floor to get your feet there, high to low to high again. It's going to be very hard to maintain your balance because your center of gravity is going to be going from high or low to high, to uh, from high to low to to high again, and that's really hard to control where your balance is going to be, and it's it's just not effective. Especially when you're going uh, like toward the baseline or you're going across the face of the basket. That's really true. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you if you go and talk to our buddy Drew Hanlon, who works with all these pro NBA guys, spends tens of thousands of hours looking at tape of these NBA players and their shooting, and he's done research on it, he f he finds that most shots are missed because of balance issues. Yes, and yeah. that's because you know their feet are are swinging one way, or they haven't effectively made their transition from horizontal to vertical uh, momentum. Uh, but there's so many reasons why balance is extremely important. And yeah. that is one of the things that I know he works on with all of his NBA guys and, and that he stands behind on his yeah. methodology too. Yeah. So check that stuff out. Okay. Last one. Let's go. All right. Number three. Okay. Here it is. Uh, I'm going to get mine mentality. What we mean by that is that some players are so much consumed with the fact of their own scoring that they oftentimes tend to put that above team play. And what happens when you do that is that, number one, uh, you, you probably you can't carry enough of the load by yourself for your team to win. You need the other four people uh, at those positions to help you do that. Greatest example of this uh, is watching uh, the Spurs play, uh, watching the Warriors play, where they really share the ball a lot between players. Now, that doesn't mean that some of them don't make a lot of points because they do, but the upshot of it is they are ready to share the basketball, and their ego uh, is takes secondary position to uh, uh, everybody being a part of the, the, the game. And that's why they're successful, one of the major reasons they're successful. And so players who uh, shoot the ball when they're not open, uh, they take chances on uh, uh, trying to score baskets when they're closely guarded, uh, those kind of things, because they want, they want to be the man or the woman who scores more boards than anybody else. And now when we get into that, that is a real negative situation because all the people you play with, they don't like that. And one of the things that's really interesting is that from the time I was a young guy, those players were always called a black hole. And when the ball goes into them, forget it. It's never coming out again. And so they're going to get a shot off. I played with one of those kind of guys uh, 
at one point. And so one of the things that we want to talk about then is that we want to not be selfish. Uh, we want to disp- uh, uh, we want to take and share the ball with other players and not worry about our ego, about the fact that we got 28 or we got 20. Um, it, does, it doesn't. You could score fifty points, and if your team loses, what does it matter? What does it matter? You've I mean, got another L. You that's know? great. Uh, it's a team sport, and yeah. y- you need to learn to use your team uh, yeah. as, as kind of your tool for success. Yeah. And you know, it's 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 funny because if you are a well-oiled team and you're doing all the things that a, a team needs to be doing, whether that's moving without the ball or, or getting uh, ball rotations, great passing, uh, getting it into the post, whatever it is, if you guys are firing on all those cylinders and creating opportunities for each other, the, the great players will still shine in that, in that situation. Oh, yeah. And, and you it's, can, it's you can, hard to beat teams like that. Too. Yeah. It, well, that's because you are, you're not only, uh, you know, being effective as an individual you're being effective as a team and you're you're using all of those opportunities and converting those uh you know sometimes you see these players that are ball hoggish or selfish and they come down and they score 30 points yeah but how many shots did they take and how many opportunities for your team did that take up yeah uh you know that's that's one thing to always look at is are you effectively converting those opportunities and the teams that play together typically are the ones that are converting at a higher percentage than the ones where they have a selfish player or two on. Right, right. That being said, now, one of the conversations that I have with a lot of our students is this, is if they're able to score and score pretty effectively, I tell them, okay, how many, or ask them, how many shots a game do you take? And, you know, maybe they'll tell me I take six shots and they're the best shooter on their team. That's not enough. Uh, and the, to, so what, what we're getting at is there's a fine balance there and motivation as well between when you should shoot and when you shouldn't. I think that players who are really the better players on a team ought to shoot between 12 and 15 shots a game. Some games they might sit and get six. Sometimes they might get uh, you know, 18. Who knows? But they, they're the people who are able to put the ball in the hole, and we have to have those guys or girls. And so we encourage that too. But – we discourage the selfishness of just trying to take and, and shoot anything just to get the shots up. But I will also say you have to make your case for your shots to oh, be yeah. taken as well. Oh, yeah. You can't just say, well, I'm the best player on the team. I should be getting uh, 15 shots. Right. You really have to make your case by moving out the basketball, setting screens, uh, setting up opportunities for your teammates, playing defense. I mean, you cannot just go out there and stand at the top of the key. And, and chuck them up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, truly. So, you know, you are not owed anything without hard work. Right. So make your case. Okay. Are we done? Yeah, we got those three basic things there that hopefully will be helpful for all of you people uh, that are uh, watching today. And uh, Yeah, I mean, those are things that... There, there's a longer list than that, certainly. Those are things that, you know, sometimes it takes people a long time to figure out. Yes. And sometimes it's good just to hear that stuff and, you know, kind of get it in your brain so that you don't fall into those those traps. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, you know, sometimes young players, they benefit from hearing this stuff after other people have gone through it or observed it or seen it. Then you can kind of cut that out of your experience. Right. right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're done with our topic for today. Right. Hopefully that helps you guys. We are going to get into our question and answer portion of this stuff. So if you guys want to send us your questions, please send them to us in the chat. You, you can even tweet them at us. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media stuff, whether that's uh, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, we are Shot Science on all of those things. We do different things on all those places, and we'd love to have you guys there and talk to us on those places as well. Yeah. Um, so our question of the week is always this, so I'll give it to you to, to ask. Where are you from? Yeah. We want to know where you are and uh, if there's anything that we can do to help you if you're in any part of the world. That's always exciting for us to know. We're here in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, in the USA, and, and yet we have a lot of people who kind of uh, call in, like here's someone from Moscow. Yeah, Devin, okay. Devin Starr. Yeah, and that, that's really cool. We enjoy having those people, and hopefully we can help all of you, okay? Yeah, so tell us where in the world you guys are from. Where in the world. What country, where do you guys ball at? Yeah. We want to know. Yeah. Okay, so while you guys are sending us those questions and telling us where you're from, we're going to start answering some of these questions ourselves. Um, okay, so let's see here. This one is from Aaron Porter, who says, how to be better on defense. 
you know, super well, wide open question. Yeah, it really is. And, and um, you know, different people have difficulties in defense uh, for different reasons. But one of the things that you really can help yourself with is learning how to use your feet. Um, one of the things that, that used to be kind of a, fr a prevailing uh, attitude for defense was to always have your inside foot or the one closest to the split line uh, forward when you play defense. But what happened is that over time, uh, coaches figured that out, offensive coaches, and they will attack that higher foot. And then you're, you have to open up. And by the time you open up, oftentimes you're beat. And so what the um, – Philosophy has kind of changed over the last 25 years or so, and maybe less than that. And so now uh, players are typically being told to square your feet up to that defender. And if he tacks one, you're going to have an equal opportunity to turn and force him to the uh, – we always talk in terms of defensive players – pushing their players to the sideline whenever possible. And so uh, by using our feet, we're able to uh, kind of do that. Okay. And so that we think that's really important is how do you use your feet? And secondly, and I'll just throw this out really quickly, how do you use your hands? Oftentimes players are reaching too much and they're reaching in and trying to slap the ball away. And it, we, we don't discourage that uh, so much, but what we do, do teach is we always teach that when you reach for the basketball, you come from the underneath side. You don't go over the top. Too easy to slap you on the wrist, but if I come underneath, I can maybe get that ball and pop it out and I get not be called for a foul, even though I may, might make contact with it. So hands are important. We, if you go to our videos on YouTube on defense, you'll see that we talk about uh, footwork and we also talk about placement of the hands and we go uh, the rip and tip hands and go to the videos and yeah. see what that is all about. Defense 101. Go check yeah. out our videos on that. And I will also say that uh, a big thing for me is beat them to the spot. Yep. And you do do that by using your footwork. So beat them to where they want to go so that they either have to stop and do something different or they just plow you over and they get a charging foul. Yeah, you know, we didn't talk about how to use your feet so much, but that's really important. One of the things that happens is that oftentimes when we are shuffling to stay in front of the defender or stay with them, we bring our feet together. And what happens when we bring our feet together is we tend to stand up. And when we get into that tall position, we can't move our feet as well. And so we always want our feet to be about a, a foot or so apart so that we are not up and down, up and down because of, of the feet. And the other thing is you'll find on footwork on our videos, we talk in terms of um, step, drag, step and drag step and drag. We step one foot and we drag the other one over, trying to keep it in uh, contact with the floor. When we take a tall step where we go like that, the foot is off the floor too long and oftentimes they can get by you. Yep. Um, okay. so there's a lot more stuff on defense if you yep. go watch those videos. So yep. check them out. Okay. YLL Gaming says how to be a better shooter in basketball. Oh uh, gosh, we can practice. Uh, practice is the whole thing. Consist well, there's, some, there's consistent, something. Consistent, diligent, uh, practice well and even in that particular uh, comment we must say that your mechanics have to be pretty good yep if you haven't got pretty good mechanics you can practice till the cows come home and you may not develop a shot that you like and that is effective some guys do reggie miller was not the most classic shooter uh, <laughs> but he got things done because he spent so much time at it you know yeah, and you know the thing about it too is that you need to uh, approach this with the three pillars of practice. Yeah. Really work on the first pillar, which is dialing in and getting everything where it needs to be in terms of the mechanics, like you were saying, using right. something like the form shooting drill. The second pillar is the game speed, game intensity practice, where you yeah. take those things and you amp them up to game speed and game intensity, maybe add in a defender or visualize a defender. Sure. Third pillar is game experience where you go out and you play pickup games or you play uh, high school games or traveling team games and get the experience using that stuff that you developed in the first two pillars and actually kind of uh, work on uh, facing it in actual competition. Sure. Um, okay, we got some people here from uh, Mizun is from Saudi Arabia. Yusuf Fidan says, uh, hey, coach, I'm from Austria. All right. Uh, 201 Clean Sheet says, going to university in England next year and hoping to make the team. All right. Good luck. All right. Let us know if you make it. Yeah. We'd love to know it. Um, anybody else sending in, then in yet? Not yet. Okay. So it keeps telling us where you guys are from. We'd like to hear that stuff. Um, this next question is from Aaron Rainey, who says, what if your form is great, but it's just not going in? 
You know, usually that is a result of not spending enough time on dialing your shot in and uh, how you dial your shot in. We have a video that we think is just the absolute killer one for developing that consistency and it's called the form shooting drill. If you go to our YouTube uh, uh, channel, you'll find the videos on that and that's how you develop the really good shooting mechanics. And then as you shoot there in the shorter distances, you'll find that we show you, all right, move away for a step or two, and then finally you're moving back maybe nine or 10 feet. And so what you find there is that pretty soon you begin to get consistent at all of those different distances. And the more you practice on that, the better you should get. If you've got something quirky about your shot though, then that may be a, a, um, a problem for you. So you need to make sure that those shooting mechanics are pretty much spot on. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes when people say that their form is great, but it's just not going in, that maybe there isn't something so great going yeah. on too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what that is. You, one of the things that you might want to do is film yourself and take yeah. a look at what you're doing because when you're in the moment doing it, you're not always seeing everything that's going on. That's, that's really the truth of it. Yeah. So film yourself from different angles, from, uh, you know, getting the flight of the ball in the shot, yep. look at it. And is this all the things that, that are good foundational elements of shooting? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, is, yeah, getting that muscle memory, getting that experience yeah. and consistent practice in. And, you know, a lot of times people too, they don't progressively work themselves back to the deeper range shots. They, yeah. They really work hard on getting those close shots, and then as soon as they're done at five feet, they move back to 22 feet. Right. And, you know, that's not a good way to approach your practice or, or develop your range in shooting. You have to work progressively back, yeah. master the closer, and then take a step back, take a step back, take a step back. There's another part of that, too, that happens quite often. You know, some people think they're really pretty good shooters, and they are not, uh, and they don't realize that. <laughs> Um, I had a student here uh, yesterday, and uh, it was a new student I hadn't met before, and I asked him this question, which I usually do. What kind of a shooter are you anyway? I'm pretty good, coach. Uh, and so my question is, why are you here then? Okay, and so uh, his comment was, I want to get better. Okay, uh, we're going to take and spend a few minutes, and we're just going to watch you shoot. It was the most horrible thing you've ever seen. He started with the ball over here on the opposite eye, and when he finished, he finished with the hand like this. I mean, it was horrible. He shot about 10 shots, and I think he made one. Uh, and so we went through that, our practice, and he was, after about five minutes, you could tell him the beginning, he was a little, he wasn't so sure he really believed in what we were talking about. But pretty soon, he could see the shot starting to fall. And so what happened was he reshaped his shot, and as a result, his shooting by the time he left was so much better. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be better the next time he comes in because he has to spend time on it. We have homework for our, our, our students, and that homework is, okay, you've got the form shooting drill, and you've got to do that at least once a day for the next week when you come back. And so uh, sometimes I think that's a real problem. Some people think they're really better than they really are. And, you know, one of the other things, too, is that you have to practice how you will play. Yeah. Lots of times people will will work on their shooting as just a casual shoot around yeah. where, yeah. you know, it's like, hey, let's put up a shot here. Let's put up a shot over here. Let's go to half court and shoot a couple of those yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. or shoot 10 three pointers. I mean, it's it's that's not an, a good approach to practice right. because that's not what it looks like when you step into a game. If you go out there and you're diligently working on, okay, you're dialing in with the first pillar of practice and kind of getting that form shooting down, getting all the muscle memory built up, and then you amp it up to game speed where you're getting a lot of repetitions doing uh, you know, this shot off the dribble or this shot off of the pass or whatever it may be, but you are working at the speed and intensity of a game, you will see that that translates better or you know, effectively to actually playing in a game Whereas the casual shoot around, you might become the greatest player of horse on the planet. Yeah, right. But that does not translate to being uh, a good player on the basketball court. Absolutely. Okay. Um, this one is from DB11 Hoop Till, Till It Hurts, uh, who says, I stay in Chicago. Do you work out with players individually? Well, we do. We do here. Uh, yeah, we do here. Um, you know, but if it's something where you want us to work with you remotely, uh, you can get in touch with us, and we can try to figure that out. We'll figure it out if you get a hold of us. Uh, okay, this one is from Zorik, who says, basketball conditioning drills, and what about nutrition? Please help. 
Okay. Okay. Basketball conditioning drills. We like to point people in the direction of our vertical jump videos right. and the vertical jump handbook. Uh, you know, that might sound a little weird, but the thing is, is that that is actually not just a vertical jump uh, program. It is right. very much an athletic conditioning, athletic uh, kind of development program. Right. You really, uh, when you use that, that vertical jump program, you'd be surprised how much better condition that you're in, number one, and how much more explosive you become in using that. And we always encourage people to do interval uh, training instead yeah. of endurance training yeah. because that is much more functional in terms of basketball and uh, you know do things that are, are great for uh, footwork so like uh, jump rope and dot, dot drills. drills and ladder drills and things like that are great yeah. uh, in terms of nutrition we are not nutritionists yeah. but you know we know a little bit about that kind of stuff because we are in that realm try to stay away from sugary things uh, try to hard to do. Try yeah. Try, <laughs> try to eat lean proteins and lots of veggies. Uh, you need if you're if you're looking at sugary things. Kind of uh, drinks are kind of one of the things where you will find that there is tons of sugar in sports right. drinks and things right. like that. Yeah. Try to stay away from those things. Yeah. Um, but other than that, you might want to go talk to a professional about that stuff if that's something that really concerns yeah. you. There's a lots on the internet and a lot written about nutrition, and so check it out. But but talk to somebody that has degrees in that yes, from yes, legitimate yes. places. Don't just listen to people off the internet <laughs> when they're talking about things that have to do with your health. The um, internet knows all, Casey. Yeah, there's some major <laughs> wackadoodles out there. Okay. Um, this one is from Jack Gibson, who says, "How to increase range? I'm trying to get my legs into it, but I don't uh, don't think that I'm doing it right." Okay, uh, number one is that you have to really work to f get connect all those pieces. Yep. So you might tr be getting your legs into it, but is there some sticking point in your shooting mechanics that is taking away that power? Have you really made all those pieces fit together so that it flows from feet to follow through? Uh, that would be the first place that I would look. Right. Second thing that I would say, and I'm sure you would agree, is that you need to work on progressively working your way back. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. So how would they do that? Well, one of the things that we do is, you know, we are successful maybe at 10 feet and we're thinking, oh boy, and I move back to uh, 20 feet uh, beyond the line and the three line and we couldn't hit anything. Okay. And it's typically because we rely too much on our arms and shoulders for that power. And we can't do that. Once again, another student yesterday that was suffering from that problem, and, and finally we were able to get through how you connect the, the legs to the stroke. And here, in a nutshell, is how you do it. Oftentimes, we want to take, and when we get power and we know we're back, we really rack the shoulders, and, and this is what we do here, and the power then and accuracy just goes out the window. What we want, whether we're 10 feet or 20 feet, is the same stroke and motion with our shot, okay? And so what we need is that extra power. The largest muscles in our body are located in our midsection, our hips, and thighs, and lower legs. That's where 80% of our power comes from. And in order to be able to shoot the ball effectively, we have to connect that with our shooting stroke. The uh, arms themselves are nothing, and shoulders, our hands, all of that, it's just mostly about direction. It's gonna take the ball where it needs to go. And the power is gonna be generated by those big pins that you have that you're standing on. Okay, so here's how you do it. When you wanna connect the stroke to the shot, you must take and start your shot before uh, you uh, catch your the legs. ball or pick it up. Well, actually what you wanna do is I'm getting ready to shoot. I need to get my uh, shot ready to go. And before my legs finish, I have to already be into the stroke. That way we connect and get the power of that. Now that's a, on like a set shot or free throw or something like that. But if we're shooting jump shots now, it's a different kind of a program. When we're shooting jump shots, oftentimes we lose power because we hold the ball at the top of the jump. We jump in the air and we hang there for a moment before we release it. And the only power we've got is this uh, upper body power, which is about 20% of the total. And what happens is we're always flat and short. So you need to learn how to connect the two together. And we have video on that too. And one of the things that I was uh, kind of hinting at earlier is that you need to progressively work back using the form shooting drill. Right. If you're starting at, at two feet, you need to master that using the form shooting drill. Yeah. And after you master that, take a tiny step back, master that, 
tiny step back, master that, until you get back into the, to those deeper ranges. Because if you do that, you will put yourself in a situation where your mechanics won't degrade with that added, uh, you know, kind of distance where you need to figure out the power. You ha can add the power in, but your mechanics stay the same. Exactly. Exactly. And if you don't work back, that's not a good thing. Here's what I want to address right here. Well, hold on. I was going to say, oh, oh okay. All right. I, I was just going to say Fred2254 is from Slovakia. All right. We have Anthony Alfaro from Oxnard, California. All right. From the Central Valley. All right. Central Valley. Well, that's like, it's like Southern California. It's like near LA. Where's that? Oxnard. Oh, that's down on the coast. Yes, yep. that's right. South of Santa, uh, Santa Barbara. Santa yeah. Barbara and LA, kind of yep. in between. Yep. Okay, this one is from, this one? Yep. Uh, Din V Star, who says, my assist hand is hurting my shot. It has bad rotation. How can I fix it? Thank you. Get it off the ball at the moment you're releasing the ball. If you watch the great shooters, and you watch it particularly in slow motion, as they get to the top of the jump, the shooting hand will take over and it shoots it all by itself. And the other hand, the assist hand, the problem you're having is this thumb usually is swiping at the ball as you release it. And so you have to get this hand off the basketball uh, for that to take and come right straight through. So that's the answer to that one. And, and you, you can work on it by doing the form shooting drill without that hand on the ball. Exactly. Just one hand shooting. And what you're going to find is that the ball probably is going to go straighter for you where you want it to go when you get one hand on it. When you have the other hand, it pitches it to the right, it pitches it to the left, and it has sideways rotation typically. And we want really true backspin when you are actually shooting the ball. Hope that'll help you out. Yeah, you just have to learn to eliminate the influence of that hand. Yeah, just get it off the ball before you release, and, and you can do it. Yeah, I mean, you can if you go watch our video on how to shoot in or it's a shooting in slow motion you can watch me and rachel demita shoot a basketball and you can see that our assist hand as we go up and elevate with our shooting hand the assist hand really just falls away or it just lets the other hand kind of go people that have problems with that hand it continues up and it goes with that other hand and all of a sudden a one-handed shot that is very accurate turns into a two-handed shot yeah. that is not accurate because yeah. you're adding in another variable like we talked about, right. and those variables are what kill your shooting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, this one is from Little Wolf who says, can they see the live chat? We can. Yeah, uh, we're looking at it just like you are. Yeah, but we, we try to hit as many questions as we can, so we're not always up to the minute that you guys post. Yeah. Um, but if you guys have questions, please send them our way. Um, let's take some more here uh giddy witty says i'm a very explosive player and what are ways that i can really use it for my advantage well just continue to use it be explosive um typically that explosiveness has to do when you are using the basketball and you're attacking the, the defender um and you know if you are really explosive that puts defenders at a real disadvantage one of the things that i would really uh, um encourage you to do is this is don't always be explosive one of the things that defensive players have the most difficulty with is changes of speed and so you go at them really hard and then you hesitate and then you go on them again and you'll find that you're able to get by them when you hesitate like you're going to pull up and shoot even even they keep your dribble alive what is going to happen is they're going to stop and you've created some space when you do that and maybe you've got the shot, but what's going to happen is they're going to they're going to take and fill that space right away. When they are coming toward you, take it and go by them. You'll yeah. find that that really helps you a bunch. Yeah, exactly. I think that the key takeaway here is changes of speed right. and changes in direction are oh, yeah. really uh, yeah. thing. I mean, it's the key to beating somebody in basketball. Yeah. And if you're able to do those things effectively, you will find that you will have no problem getting to the basket and getting easy shots. Right. Let me elaborate just a second, and I'll try to make it short. Oh, boy. <laughs> when you attack a defender and he's moving with you aggressively, one of the things that you want to do is make a mental read on where he is or where she is. And if you find that they are, uh, that you are even with them, 
uh, go get whatever you want because they're not going to be able to stop you. But you find that if they're a little bit ahead of you, it's time for you to do something to uh, like the uh, change of speed or to use a counter move like a scissor dribble, a flat back dribble and go in the, the opposite direction because it's really difficult for them to take them and make that big turn when you uh, change directions on them. But you have to read, first of all, where are they? And a reading means that you're, you're seeing what that defender is doing and then you're gonna make a reaction to that. They're ahead, I'm gonna counter. They're even, I'm gonna go get it. Okay. Okay, I wanna ask another question of you guys. So leave your comments in the chat. Okay. Who is your favorite basketball player? Oh yeah, that's cool. I wanna know who your favorite basketball player is. So leave that in the comments uh, in the chat and yeah. we will take a look at that in just a few minutes. And yeah. keep sending your questions. Yeah. Um, Zoo Manny says, when should you look at the defender's feet on offense? Um, you <laughs> Looking at the feet on, on anybody on offense or defense is a great way to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah. Because feet aren't always going the, the way that the body is going to go. Right. Um, I think that it's always good to have a soft focus on whoever you're guarding or whoever is guarding you. And if you see like a defender who sticks one foot in front of the other or one is higher than the other, that's always a good uh, foot to attack right. and make them have to open up and then recover to your, your attack. Right. Um, but if you're looking at their feet, uh, you know, kind of focusing on that, then you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. Yeah, Not yeah, a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Like Casey's terminology there, I think is really great. You want a soft focus. In other words, you're not just peering at their feet, they're not peering at their midsection, their eyes or anything like that, but you have a soft focus on their whole body. And when you do that, you can get a really good picture of what they're doing. Yeah, you never, when you're playing on, mostly on, on defense, but also on offense, you never wanna look at extremities or eyes. If you're looking at their feet, or you're looking at their hands, or you're looking at their head or eyes, that is where they can kind of uh, send you in the wrong direction. Exactly. And, you know, really their midsection is really kind of where they have to go. Yeah. You can't go anywhere without that being attached to you. Um, okay. What about that one right there? What? Uh, it's Andy Lou, I think. Andy Lou says, what's, where? Okay. This up here? Right here. Andy Lee was asking me, I was wondering, how can I get into the zone? Like, for example, I'm on fire, and then a few days later, I'm cold. How can I get to the zone? Well, well you don't want to get in and out of the zone. You, no. want to, you really want to get to the point where the zone is basically your shooting acuity. Yeah, and you know, you're going to have days where you can shoot really well. That's probably the zone. There are going to be days when you couldn't hit a bull in the butt with a scoop shovel, too. And that's another zone. What happens though, the more time you spend developing your, uh, your stroke in different shooting situations, the more effective you're gonna become. The best shooters in the world uh, have those days where they go zero for 10 on field goals from the three line. Uh, and some of them are worse than that. And so, uh, and then you turn right around and uh, you'll find that maybe they go nine for 10 in the next game. So that zone isn't always a fixed uh, kind of situation that you're always in. Uh, sometimes the zone you're in is that you couldn't hit them. Uh, that, that's the way that happens sometimes. But practice sure helps a, a ton. Consistent, diligent practice yeah. really is what will do it for you. Yeah. And you, you have to also accept the fact that you are going to have those ups and downs and that it, it basically evens out over time. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, so you guys are sending us your, your comments to who your favorite basketball player is. We have Old Glory Fam who says Clay Thompson. All right. The Reviews Dude says Kyrie Irving. Good choice. Nevsky Nevitt says John Stockton. Good choice again. Yusef Fidon says Hakeem Olajuwon. All right. Den V Star says Allen Iverson, no doubt. Uh, Adam Katz Merrick says Paul George. Michael or Michael, Michael Tim Zinko says LeBron for the win. Paul George says Paul George. Uh, Amin Dawo says Kawhi Leonard. All right. Awesome. So those are great choices, yeah, guys. Keep sending them in. We want to know. Um, okay. This question is from the reviews dude. who says, "Should I focus on getting better rotation on the ball, or should I just keep keep it going, keep it if it's going in?" Well, you know, this opens up a whole uh, can of worms, so to speak. We are not big on a lot of rotation when you shoot the basketball, and I'm not going to go into a great depth on that. You can go to our, our YouTube channel and you can find where we talk about rotation. Well, we can talk about it briefly, though. Just very briefly. I don't want to just get into it deep, but 
the one thing that we don't like about a lot of rotation is that when the ball lands on a hard surface like the rim, if it's spinning fast, it has an awful lot of energy that is contained inside of the rotation of that basketball. And when it hits the rim, it wants to expend that energy and it creates a long rebound. We don't like that. So and so a, hang on, a, hang on a so second. So it makes a hard a shot. A hard and usually a longer rebound. Now, if you have a shot that is spinning slower, and most of the better shooters in, in the NBA that we've, we've come across have that slow rotation. And what happens is it runs into the iron and there is not very much energy involved in the ball because it is not spinning as fast. It's gentle. And it's gentle. And they tend to bounce and stay around the basket. And what is coupled with that, that kind of rotation is a nice arc. And if you've got a nice arc and a slow rotation ball, you are really helping yourself out in making shots because the ball will tend to be soft on the rim. It will tend to stay around the rim, which gives you a great chance to put it in the rim. Yeah, which is why we don't like it when people say flick your wrist yeah. or, or snap your wrist. Those are horrible terms yeah. because they imply that you're trying to get as much rotation on yeah. the ball as you can. Right. We want a gentle finger flop finish yeah. where you are giving that gentle rotation to the ball because when it gets there, you just want enough spin so that the shot is stable in the air. But when it hits the rim or the backboard, it basically dies and it just stays there yeah. and has fingers because yeah. if if it hits and it's just it's spinning like a top, it's, it's still going to fly off of there and yeah. you don't get any of those second chances yeah. uh, for it to go in. Yeah. Even though you know uh, a lot of people tell you to get that rotation like that, right. that is not really the logical uh, best way to make it work. Right, right. So, Does that mean you can't put it in the basket? Now it doesn't mean that you can put it in the basket, but how many times you get nothing but net? Yeah, not that often. Would you like uh, the the ability to have a second chance on that shot? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, the best shooters really do have that second chance ability. That's why you'll see the ball kind of bounce two, three, four times before it goes in. Yeah. It doesn't always swish. So the keys there are a slower rotation. And you go to our videos and you'll see flop finish. It'll tell you how to get that slower rotation. Um, Amin Dawo says, how to shoot free throws. I can make some, but it's, I think you meant to say, inconsistent. Also, the ball can come off the wrong finger. Thanks, coach. Get it off the right fingers. I mean, it's that simple. Um, you know, that's a shot that is free. There's no defense. There's, there's nothing really that is inhibiting your shot there. And so... I would spend time on working on making sure that ball comes off the first two fingers every time you release it, that the elbow doesn't flare out when you start to shoot it. Because when your elbow flares out, several things happen. Number one, the ball tends to come off of these last three fingers and the ball tends to be short and flat. So if you get that uh, a nice rotation coming off the first two fingers and your arm elevates right straight to the basket, you'd be in a good, pretty good place. Yeah. And it's just practice. Yeah. Practice, practice. I mean, you've identified the problem, or at least one of the problems, so fix that. Yeah. And the other thing is is that when it comes to free throws, people typically have too uh, crazy or uh, you know intensive of a routine. Yeah. They go out there and they, they bounce the ball five times, and they spin it around their waist, and then they you know check on their girlfriend in the stands, and mm -hmm. then they blow a kiss to whoever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's literally, if you can keep it to... You just bounce the ball twice, and you don't look at the rim. And then as you go up, you look at the rim, and you shoot it. Well, it is really, if you keep it simple, you make it repeatable. And we talked about variables and everything before. Yeah. Limit the variables in your shooting mechanics. And that routine is part of your shooting mechanics for the free throw. It is. It is. So it, it's good to have a routine. Yeah. Just keep it very simple yeah. because you want to repeat it and have it be the same every single time. Right. Uh, something that I've kind of paid a lot of attention to for a long, a long time is this. Uh, our players who go to the free throw line and they take too long at the free throw line. They bounce the ball, they look up, they bounce it around, and they've taken five, six, seven seconds before they shoot it. They almost always miss it. And it doesn't make any difference what level it is, is that when you take too long and all these other things are going through your mind and you haven't got a real program, uh, usually going to miss it. Okay. okay, Andy Liu, I think he was having a, a crisis here because he's, he sent us three players. He says, uh, thanks, mine is Curry, Steve Nash, and Jason Williams. Okay. Right. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah, so keep sending those in. I just thought that was funny. Uh -huh. um, let's see here. This one is from, where did I see that? I just I just saw it. D uh, Den V Star says, 
uh, my English isn't good. What is follow through? Oh, that Go means follow through means that you are finishing whatever action. If I'm passing, I want to take and snap the wrist so the wrist come through on the pass. That's a follow through. Kind of like the touch at the end. Of yeah, it. right at the end. And when we shoot, this is the follow through part of it right here. Okay. That flop finish follow through. Yeah. And you can go watch our videos and we talk about that and show it and all that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Grant Stevenson says, I'm a middle schooler and I took 1,000 free throws a little earlier today. Out of the 1,000, I made 943. Is that decent? That is awesome. That's a lot of free throws. Yeah, it is an awful. That, that is a great number. You know, I, I uh, the, the thing that's really important is, is our, this is something I would do. I'm sorry, I'm kind of back and forth, but what I would do is this. I would go ahead and shoot those thousand shoot, uh, shots if you want to, but I wouldn't just take and shoot them all in a row or uh, that sort of thing. What I would do is I'd get out and exhaust myself a little bit and then come back and shoot them because they don't mean anything when we don't have uh, uh, some fatigue involved in the game. And so one of the things that makes it really good for you to work on your free throws is to maybe run uh, uh, lines there for a few minutes and get yourself a little bit fatigued, then go over and shoot them. Okay? Well, that, that's, and, that, that's that functional training that we yeah, talk about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we always see or that's typical is that people come in and their free throw practice is always what they start off the day with. Yes, exactly. Because I mean, it's low impact. It's like easy. Um, you know, it's, it's not very intensive. And so they use it as like almost a warm up. Yeah. And that is not a good approach to become a great free throw shooter yeah, exactly. because when you're deep in the fourth quarter and you're at the line and you're gas and you step to the line, you have not been there before. Yeah. You, you've made those shots fresh you know, you could you could be a ninety percent free throw shooter, fresh, but when you step to the line in the fourth quarter and you've never shot at that fatigue level, yeah. you will pr almost guaranteed not shoot uh, even half as well as you think you will. Right, and and the thing, this is not to uh, kind of put down the fact that you made all these free throws. That's awesome. It yeah. really is, uh, but it's not uh, uh, applicable to the game of basketball in the fact that you're never going to have a chance where you're going to get to uh, shoot uh, 15 in a row in a game. You're just not. And what's going to happen, like Casey's saying, and this is really key to understand, is that if we can do that after we exhaust ourselves and we shoot 10 and we make 10, okay, and then we go – uh, 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 some more interval training and come back and we shoot another 10, that's going to be the telltale of how you're going to shoot when you're playing in a game. Well, okay. I, I don't think it's also bad that he shoots no. like that. No. I think that that is really a test of, of uh, kind of your, your mechanics and skills, but also mostly like a mental test. Right. Because for you to mentally be in that space where you can make that many, shoot that many, and keep things consistent, that's, that's actually pr a pretty great feat. And that's fine mm -hmm. to do every once in a while. But if you are training to be a great in-game free throw shooter, you really need to make sure you're doing it uh, in this functional way where you're right. doing it uh, in intervals during your practice all throughout. Exactly so that, right. you know, maybe you come in and do it as a warm up, but you're also doing it uh, 30 minutes in. You're doing yeah. it 45 minutes in. You're doing it 50 minutes in. You're doing it as you are about to leave the gym yeah. uh, so that you are hitting at all those different levels of fatigue. And uh, w there was something else I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I can't oh, hold those thoughts either. Oh, crap. That, that would've, it was a good thing, too. Oh, okay. Maybe it'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, let's see here. Uh, Amin Dabo says, how to make the most out of practice. Oh, gosh. You know, uh, that's a great question. And something that I, I heard recently, uh, um, and this was aimed at, at youth coaches, um, but one of the things that they were talking about is youth coaches need to make uh, practices uh, very meaningful. And, and everything has to have a purpose. Why are we doing this? Uh, and then you direct everything that way. And so I think that the, getting the most out of practice is is not getting too many little things, but keeping maybe four or five big things that you work on maybe one day and then the next day you th uh, thread in some other things that kind of pulled all together. And, and I think that when you are taking practice like that, then players begin to absorb more. If we just go out and play, and I know that I have seen this myself for a long time, is that oftentimes club teams, they'll get together because they can only meet once or twice a week. Uh, and they come and they, all they do is play. 
and there's not much coaching really going on. And or individual so, skill development. Or individual skill development. And so I think that's something that is kind of too bad. And, uh, you know, when Casey was playing and we had uh, club teams that he and his brothers played on, uh, we practiced two or three times a week, and we actually practiced on developing skills for them to use. And we didn't have much in the way of plays. Uh, we had four or five things that we did. But you, um, you teach to learn how to play. Learn how to play. And that's that's what I think that basketball should be all about. In fact, as you talk to or, or read stuff that's put out there by uh, Kobe Bryant and, and uh, uh, Steve Kerr and other people that are voicing their opinion about that kind of basketball is that there's not enough basketball that is being taught uh, on a um, – practical level uh it's all about uh uh just getting out there and playing and, and using your athleticism not everybody's got that athleticism they need to be able to and, learn how to do all that stuff. and here is the other thing too is that in situations like that you also are playing i mean what is, what is your goal for playing on this team yeah. is it just to play games and serve that team or is it also to get something out of it for yourself mm -hmm. to help develop you as a player and maybe help you move to the next levels of basketball. Well, and that's really what the kind of the mission statement of that stuff is, or, but... Or ought to be, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm saying is that it ought to be, but a lot of times if you choose the wrong team, wrong coach, wrong setting, that it, it is actually more about them or it's more about the team yeah. and, 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 and winning and winning yeah. when it really should be more about your development as a player. Exactly right. Exactly uh, right. Okay, Grant Stevenson says... Uh, this is in reply to the, the free throw thing. He says, I usually run a bit first ever since last season because my coach stressed conditioning, conditioning. And thanks for the advice. I'll try running and working out every 25 free throws. But thanks again. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, we're not saying that what you did was bad. It was no. actually awesome. It's, it's awesome. There's no question about that. But, yeah. you, you know, you, we want to help you guys translate that awesomeness into practical game uh, execution. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to take like two more and then we're going to get out of here, you guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you see any that you really want to jump onto? How about this one right here? Okay, sure. Richmond, Richmond Deos Reyes says, I get nervous when many people watch the game. What should I do? <laughs> quit, quit worrying about people watching the game. Um, and, and that's easy to say because your ego is involved. Your girlfriend is involved, uh, possibly, and, and you want to look good in front of everybody. The upshot of it is, is that you need to rely upon yourself to go out and play your game and not allow all of these other things that are, are kind of side distractions affect how you play. Now that's easy to say. One of the things that, that we would encourage is this, is that you don't think about anybody else. In fact, I, I can remember as a player, and I don't know if it was good or bad at the time, but I can remember as a player, uh, I was oblivious uh, to the people who were in the stands I was so focused on the game itself, and thank goodness for that, uh, that I didn't worry about what people were thinking about me. If I did, it probably wasn't very for very long. And the thing is, is you're looking for uh, really positive feedback for yourself from these people that are watching the game. Uh, don't do that. It's easy to say what you want to do out and go out and play for yourself and play for your team and let that be your motivation as opposed to approval from somebody maybe who is uh, uh, sitting up in the stands. Yeah, that's and my you, guess. you know, you're the person that's out there actually doing something. Uh, the people in the stands are, are just there to observe. Yep. You, you know, you don't need their approval or validation. You just need to go out there and play the game that you've been practicing and working hard to play. They and, probably don't know as much about it as you do either. Yeah, and you know, the thing about it is that you have to be playing in the present when you're out there on yeah. the court you cannot be worried about the past you can't be worried about the future you really just need to be present in what you're doing yeah um and that takes a mental switch to do it does yeah. and you know all the great players are not worried about what the cheerleader in the first row is thinking or what their mom and dad are thinking at home watching on tv sure. or whatever they are really focused in on what they are doing yeah run that up just a little bit what do you mean right there where there's one i wanted to read well, then go for it. Okay. I don't well, know which one you're talking about. Well, I, I know. Uh, it says, this is somebody responding, I think, to Paul George. I know he keeps his offhand on longer and touches the back of his shooting wrist on the follow-through. Uh, I don't know about using this thumb. Well, okay. everybody's yeah. different, but I don't care what Paul George does. 
here's the thing that I think is really important, uh, is that for you to be effective, you want to take and get that hand off the basketball and, and get it off before you try to release it because that thumb will create problems. Yeah, and you know sometimes you'll hear people that give you these weird little things yeah. to do when you're shooting and all these extra uh uh, you know, kind of task to, to pull off. Yeah. Forget that stuff. That is the, the worst thing you can do is get caught up in, oh, well, if I put my finger here on this spot on my hand, when I re don't do that. Take the foundational elements of shooting, work on drilling them, get them to where they need to be, work on uh, videotaping your shot to look at how you are performing from a different perspective and don't do these kind of like get get rich quick schemes for your yeah, shot. Yeah. Don't use gadgets. Don't use shooting aids that are uh, things that you'll have to wean yourself off of. Uh, do the work and yeah. you will find that your shooting will get to where it needs to be. Absolutely. Well. And last question is from Ryan Fusco who says, some tips to improve your general athleticism. Go check out our vertical jump videos and the vertical jump handbook. We, get, we do a deep dive on that stuff and we think yeah. it'll really help you guys. Yeah. Okay. So if we didn't get to your questions, it's not because we don't like you. It's because we just ran out of time. Make sure you guys keep sending us your answers to the two questions. Number one being, where are you from? Where yeah. do you play basketball? Right. Uh, where in the world are you from? And number two, who is your favorite basketball player? Because we want to know that. Leave those in the comments, and we will check them all out. Uh, make sure you're following us on all of our social media stuff, whether that's Facebook, Google+, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. We are shot science on all those things, doing different things in all those places. And we would love to have you guys there during the week. And if you want your question answered and you didn't get it answered today, make sure that you uh, show up next time, 1 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday for another live show. Yeah, exactly right. And thank you so much for watching. We appreciate this and enjoy it so much. That's, that's really full. Cool. Yep. Uh, see you guys next time. See ya. Bye.